And in that show of solidarity, those pilots won more than a military victory. They won hearts and minds, love and loyalty and trust, not just from the people in this city, but from all those who heard the story of what they did here. Now the world will watch and remember what we do here, what we do with this moment. Will we extend our hand to the people in the forgotten corners of this world who yearn for lives marked by dignity and opportunity, by security and justice? Will we lift the child in Bangladesh from poverty and shelter the refugee in Chad and banish the scourge of AIDS in our time? Will we stand for the human rights of the dissident in Burma, the blogger in Iran, or the voter in Zimbabwe? Will we give meaning to the words, never again in Darfur? Will we acknowledge, will we acknowledge that there is no more powerful example than the one each of our nations projects to the world? Will we reject torture and stand for the rule of law? Will we... Will we, will we welcome immigrants from different lands and shun discrimination against those who don't look like us or worship like we do and keep the promise of equality and opportunity for all of our people? People of Berlin, people of the world, this is our moment. This is our time. I know my country has not perfected itself. At times, we've struggled to keep the promise of liberty and equality for all of our people. We've made our share of mistakes. And there are times when our actions around the world have not lived up to our best intentions. But I also know how much I love America. I know that for more than two centuries, we have strived at great cost and great sacrifice to form a more perfect union, to seek with other nations a more hopeful world. Our allegiance has never been to any particular tribe or kingdom. Indeed, every language is spoken in our country. Every culture has left its imprint on ours. Every point of view is expressed in our public squares. What has always united us, what has always driven our people, what drew my father to America's shores is a set of ideals that speak to aspirations shared by all people. That we can live free from fear and free from want. That we can speak our minds and assemble with whomever we choose and worship as we please. These are the aspirations that join the fates of all nations in this city. These aspirations are bigger than anything that drives us apart. It is because of these aspirations that the airlift began. It is because of these aspirations that all free people everywhere became citizens of Berlin. It is in pursuit. It is in pursuit of these aspirations that a new generation, our generation, must make our mark on the world. People of Berlin and people of the world, the scale of our challenge is great. The road ahead will be long. But I come before you to say that we are heirs to a struggle for freedom. We are a people of improbable hope, with an eye towards the future, with resolve in our heart. Let us remember this history and answer our destiny and remake the world once again. Thank you, Berlin. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. With soaring rhetoric, lofty hopes, addressing a crowd that German officials say is more than 100,000 strong, presumptive Democratic nominee Barack Obama, echoing Ronald Reagan, as well as others who have spoken here said that the walls that now must come down must be torn down are the walls between races and tribes, natives and immigrants, Christian and Muslim, and that 
the walls between these people cannot stand. These now are the walls we must tear down. Barack Obama calling for an end to nuclear weapons, calling for a joint fight with Europeans against terror, and importantly, suggesting that his country, the country he says he loved, has not loves has not always perfected itself. At times, he said, we've struggled to keep the promise of liberty and equality for all of our people. Joining me here, Richard Wolff, Newsweek magazine, and back in Washington, Chuck Todd, political director of NBC News. Richard, first to you. You've watched him throughout this trip. You've watched him since the beginning of his campaign. What has he accomplished here today? Well, this is a very different challenge for him. Obviously, we've seen him going through these one-on-ones with leaders and press conferences, but clearly what he's accomplished here is that image. The giant crowd between the Victory Column and the Brandenburg Gate, and a crowd waving American flags. I mean, when you contrast that with what we've seen with President Bush, generating big crowds, protesting against his presence, protesting against the war, that's really the, the image he is trying to project to Americans saying, you can vote for me and I will unite the world, be a popular president, uh, something obviously that has been very unusual over the last seven years. And we should point out that for more than six or perhaps seven years, you followed President Bush everywhere he traveled as right. well. So you can understand the contrast. There is a huge contrast. Really, there is only one country I can remember of seeing people on the streets in this way. That's Vietnam. And, uh, you know, when it comes to old Europe, Western Europe, you don't see people waving American flags. Not now. Chuck Todd, what is the political advantage that he achieves, if any, and what are the political risks for him to be the, uh, embraced by Europe? Well, clearly this was a, a, about symbolism because, you know, there wasn't a lot of message that he was really sending in the speech. The speech, frankly, could have been one given by John McCain. Everything in there John McCain would have been comfortable agreeing with and probably saying to a similar audience. But this was about, it was almost as if he was trying to give his acceptance speech to be one of the nominees to be leader of the free world. I mean, it was, it, it felt like the audience there was not just the United States, and I think we had gotten some, uh, we had gotten some uh, guidance that this was, you know, purely going to be for a U.S. audience, but it did feel like he was running to be leader of the free world in, in some form. And, you know, we'll, we'll see how it plays. I'm sure it's going to play very well there. I mean, it, it, there was nothing in there that was, came across as disagreeable. Uh, if anything, the only thing I would have been a little nervous about if I were an Obama person was the fact when he said the line about uh, uh, America hasn't always been perfect, there were some cheers in the background. That's not something uh, that the Obama campaign wanted to hear. You almost could see Obama quickly speaking over that moment. But uh, beyond that, I mean, look, it's the visual that they want uh, out of this. They want the fact that people, what, what Richard just said, people are cheering in Europe, waving American flags as if they're excited about an American president again. Interestingly, uh, John, you said that this is a speech John McCain could have given. John McCain told reporters today that he would like to give a speech in Germany as U.S. president, but not as a candidate, suggesting uh, with a swipe at his rival that there is something inappropriate, perhaps, about this, about giving a major speech. The quote is, I'd love to give a speech in Germany, said McCain, a political speech or a speech that maybe the German people would be interested in, but I'd much prefer to do it as president of the United States rather than as a candidate for the office of the presidency telling reporters that in Columbus, Ohio today, uh, standing in front of a neighborhood known as German Village. Interestingly, McCain, for whom, of course, foreign policy is considered a strength, said he would focus on issues at home. Uh, what does he have to do to compete with these kinds of images? Well, I say, Andrew, I, I mean, I think that, that in one hand, he probably should have not tried to compete this week, almost ceded the week in one, uh, in one way to Obama and instead maybe try to camp out in one state. You know, I've been wondering what would have happened if he had just decided to do a bus trip all throughout the state of Michigan, where, okay, fine, he wants to give uh, Obama the world stage, he can have it, and he's just going to sit there and focus on the economy and, and not get distracted. But the campaign seemed a little bit distracted uh, by the amount, uh, by the attention that Obama was getting. And look, they're worried. Obama doesn't, the bar for him to prove his ability to be commander in chief to be president isn't that high. Uh, when you have, uh, when you have uh, uh, an electorate that wants change very badly, they're, they're looking, they're just looking for C plus work here. And so it was pretty easy to see that this trip was gonna be a success unless he you know, tripped over himself somehow while walking to the victory column or something like that. So I, I think that, that 
the Republicans just maybe, they, they may have panicked a little bit, too much so on this trip.